Hi. I'll bet you guys were really surprised. I came all the way through the audience and then hung out over there in the dark like you didn't know I was coming. <laughs> yeah, everyone was like, hi, Anna. You're walking through the aisle. Um, but we're here to talk about Anna's book, Scrappy Little Nobody. If you haven't read it, it is hilariously funny. It made my miserable New Jersey commute enjoyable. Oh, oh that's great. Yes, it Thank did. Thank you. Um, well, it took one day, one day to read it. So one day of commuting. Made it yeah, work. it took me a day to write it. It's no big deal. <laughs> It's a year of my life. Um, but to get started, if in the book. Sorry, I insisted that we use hand mics, so yeah. I'm a jerk. Because, <laughs> but it's just because I need a prop, you know? Um, but in the book, you talk about the paparazzi. But other than that, and just talking to you backstage, you seem completely unfazed by fame. And obviously, you're really famous. Yeah, it's just so, where I'm really comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so my questions are, A, is that true? And B, what's the creepiest thing a fan has ever done? Um, I don't want to put anybody on blast. They might be in the audience. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, I mean, like people have shown up at my house and I'm always like, bro, you can't be at my house. It's like a nine-year-old girl. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> come on, you know, come on. Um, but that's always like, I don't know, like what I'm supposed to do about that. Um, other than be like, I'm, you know, in like, my bathrobe cleaning, so I, I guess this picture was worth it for you. Um, but I did once have a, f this wasn't really even about me, but I was shooting one of the later uh, Twilight movies in Vancouver, and I was like in uh, an American Eagle, and I was like looking at underwear, as, as a lady is wont to do, and, um, and a girl came up to me and she was like, hi, um, are you gonna see Taylor Lautner? Uh, soon, and I was like, uh, "Yeah, because we're filming." And she was like, um, I, "I, I have something for him," and I was like, "I really need to say no to this girl because I was really worried it was going to be like a thumb or something. <laughs> like, why? Like, did she? Why does she have it with her? I was just in like a store, and she <laughs> ran into me. And why did she have a thing? She carried a thing at all moments for Taylor Lautner in case she ran into him or somebody that knows him. And I thought, like, this can't be good. This is going to be a lock of hair or, or like, <laughs> anthrax. I don't Sounds know. Like, I can't well, what be a part it? of this. I don't know because oh, I was like, I really, ma'am, I really can't. Oh. I called her ma'am. She was very young, but I was trying to <laughs> keep my distance. That is hilarious. Because oh I didn't want to see sure it. I'm sure you've seen it hand. Um, so you're an actress, you're a singer, so everyone knows she sings. Um, and I recently saw your lip sync battle with John Krasinski, and I was like, oh, she can dance. I was like, great. Well, she can do everything. Yeah. Now she's an author. That was just me like right. sticking out my butt pertaining to dance. It was supposed <laughs> to be funny. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Um, but I was like, oh, and now she can write. She wrote a book. She's an author, too. Um, I am amazing. Is that you, your question? You really are. <laughs> um, <laughs> question is, how long did it take, and what was the impetus for you writing? Like, What made you want to write a book? Uh, well, I wrote um, a piece for Vogue that, like, looking back on it, I, I had to turn it in... Um, it was like supposed to be a diary of uh, an Oscars weekend, like one of the times I was presenting, and I had to turn it in Monday morning and after the Oscars, okay. and you're out pretty late that night. So um, I wrote it really quickly and on very little sleep. So um, like looking back on it, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it, that's when like I started getting approached about writing, writing. a book, and I think like. I thought at some point somebody was going to stop me. Like, I was like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and I was expecting somebody to be like, I was expecting to turn in a couple of chapters and like mutually go, this probably wasn't a good idea. Let's not do this. <laughs> and that didn't happen. So um, I wrote, uh, I think I wrote like the kind of bulk of it in this 45-day um, period where I knew that I was never going to become that person that could like write on my lunch break and like find time and find balance. Right. Not really my thing, balance. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, I was between movies and I uh, like had this 45 day period. So I wrote 2000 words a day, every wow. day for 45 days. And it didn't have to be good, but I had to write something, 2000 words. And that was like, and I had to be really strict with myself because if I give myself an inch, I'll take a mile, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a really bad person. So, uh, <laughs> 
the that was like where I wrote a lot of it, and a lot of that stuff wasn't good and isn't in the book, but uh, that was kind of where I started, I and and then like you know the year after that was about like. Um, expanding on things that were interesting and losing things that weren't interesting. And oh, and, and in a lot of cases, that meant, like, entire sections, sections. you know. Like, uh, the section about being nice, is like, didn't come until right toward the very yeah. end because I was, like, in a bad mood and was like, ugh, <laughs> here's this stupid yeah. thing I wrote. And you're probably not going to want to use it. And my editor liked it a lot. So. Liked it. Oh, yeah. it's wonderful. Um, <gasps> so... <gasps> Whose phone just went off? Someone... <laughs> Shame. <laughs> um, for those of you who haven't seen Camp, so you talk about Camp in your book, your first movie, yeah. 2003. It's amazing. And I love the, like, the show Must Go On scene. I must have watched it on YouTube a million oh. times. Loved it. Thanks. I love it. I just watched it this morning um, with somebody. So I was like, <laughs> I love it that much. Um, but you talk a lot about how that experience shaped you. You were with a lot of like younger actors and actresses on set yeah. at a camp, like a real yeah. live camp. Yeah. Um, and so the question is, like, what about that experience do you still hold on to in that character, specifically, Fritzy? Like, what do you still hold on to from that? Well, the character was so, was such an interesting experience for me because at the time, like, I was 16 or 17 and I just, like, wanted to, like, have my makeup done and be, like, and be able to be, like, guys, like, I'm in a movie and I'm playing someone normal. And that wasn't the case because um, Fritzy is, like, the smelly girl. Um, and now I would love to play a character like that. It was just, like, about getting, like, realizing that, like, vanity just has no place in um, performance or art or um, it's just going to hold you back. So, um yeah, the scene where the, is it the director? He's like, you're a creepy little girl. Yeah. It's like, this is like a hilarious I know. character. I, I know. loved it. I know, but there were definitely times when the director had to convince me, like, because I was like, everybody's going to hate me. Everybody's going to hate <laughs> no. this character, you know? And it uh, it was a, definitely a lesson. But, you I know, when you're it. 16, like, you don't want to play the smelly girl. Right. But it's great. You got to watch it for anyone who didn't. Um, in the book, one of my favorite quotes from the book was, when you said your dad only cries when describing the storyline of the movie Rudy. That is a true fact. <laughs> Which is like, I literally like laughed out loud. I thought that was hilarious. Um, and they come in and they they put their shirt down and they say, this is for Rudy. <laughs> this is for Rudy. I was like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> we were in an Applebee's. <laughs> That's so funny. True fact. Um, um, but similarly, like the, the title of the book, Scrappy Little Nobody, and you talk about like sticking up to the bully in the school, you know, like you love that whole underdog, like David versus Goliath sort of thing, which is kind of what Rudy's all about. So it seems like similar to your dad. Whoa. Did you not make that no. connection? Oh. I'm not a very smart person. <laughs> I don't know why they let me write a book. Um, so I, as I was reading it, I was like, wow, she loves the underdog. Dad loves the underdog. So like, what is it about being the underdog? And what do you, why, why do you miss being like, uh, well, I think everybody level. feels that way. Like, no matter like where you come from in life, you you feel the the insecurities that you have. You know, you carry those with you your whole life, and um, like the best thing you can do with them is turn them into something like productive. I guess so. That's why I sing so loud, <laughs> and because I have no technique. Um, you want. <laughs> this cracks me up too. There's so there's so much in this book that is just you will laugh out loud. Um, you said once on Twitter that your dream is to live in the Thanksgiving episode of a 90s sitcom. So true. Which, like, I can totally relate to. I totally get. Um, and I was equally as excited in the book when you started describing all the holiday parties that yes. you will, like, know you'll never throw. Yes. But you, like, have that a vision really of them. That was really fun And I just want to know, like, what is, what's up with that, like, whole holiday I do, uh, Yeah, session. I don't know. Like, it, and and there, I think there, there was only, like, one of those that I had to come up with because, you know, I wanted it to, like, have a nice kind of pacing to it. Like, uh, the rest of them, I genuinely have planned parties in my head with great detail and, like, <laughs> talked about them with, like, one of my best friends and, um, like, the Christmas party especially. Like, I, every single detail I had laid out Like, every in room my head. has to be decorated with Christmas, like, yeah. decor. I think it's because, yeah. like, I don't, have much of a social life because I <laughs> have turned myself into a workaholic. So I like fantasize about like having parties and having friends <laughs> over and but having you never friends. <laughs> um, so I yeah I don't I don't know what 
that's about other than like I don't know. Does anybody else do that? Like I can relate, like plans, but I don't plan like them. Dream. No, I okay. don't plan them out that way. Um, but I can like relate. To, like I love the holidays. I love Home Alone. You talk about Home Alone in the book. Mm -hmm. Like you love. There's like a holiday theme. Yeah, I yeah. I think <laughs> it's like I don't lo love Christmas. It makes me really stressed. Like any like forced fun, like birthdays and New Year's and stuff. I like yeah. Have the best time it's of your life right now. Is <laughs> it seems counterintuitive to having a good time. Um, <laughs> but like the like season around it, I really love. do love. I know I'm supposed to hate Christmas music. Fuck you, you hate Christmas music. <laughs> Christmas music's great. So um, I love just like decorating um, everything with like tacky, tinselly garbage. Yeah, who doesn't? It's great. Um, so you describe a lot of hustle. So like as a young girl, you would take the bus from Maine, where you live with your brother, sometimes your dad, into New York City. Mm -hmm. You're on theater. Performed a lot, worked a lot as like a young young kid, really. Like, yeah. how old were you? Um, well, I started uh, coming to New York to audition when I was like ten, mm -hmm. I yeah. think, and and I I got uh, I did the brought my first Broadway show at uh, twelve, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's I just didn't I didn't think a lot about it. Like I. I th it just felt like it was my only option, you know? Like, it's just what I wanted to do. It wasn't like, like, I remember, particularly when I moved, to, like, I think at 12, it seemed more like people just assumed that it was my parents being Pushing creepy. Pushing you to do it, yeah. Um, but particularly when I moved to LA when I was um, 17, there was a lot of like, whoa, like, I could never do that. And it was like, I, I had to. Like, I didn't have a choice. It was, like, the only thing I could think to do like well, it just was necessary well, what advice would you give us you know people old young all types here in the audience but what advice would you give like younger up and coming working on your career in New York City what would you give like the younger 12 year old well, you advice the, the, the shitty thing about this is I only have a piece of truly terrible advice and I you know I say this in the book and I uh like I do feel that it's terrible advice but I was told very, very young, like, you know, when I was 11 years old, like, don't have a backup plan. That's terrible advice. <laughs> and, but I think if I had one, I would have caved, you know? Like, I absolutely, like, yeah. there was not, like, even though I felt like I have to do this, this is completely necessary, and this was my only choice, like, I never felt like, so that means it's going to work out. Right. So it, there were definitely times where I felt like I wish I hadn't listened to that advice and I did have my right. my backup plan because I wanted to, like, well, it, opt out. Yeah, and you moved to L.A. Young, still young. Like, you didn't go to college, moved to L.A. Yeah, did not go to college. Bought your Ikea furniture and just, like, worked and went on auditions. It's, it's like, actually... Yeah, so my advice right. is don't have a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, it's don't okay, don't have a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone... <laughs> Um, and do drugs. But I with guess. that, it's uh, <laughs> hilarious. All right, we'll take our we'll take our first audience question. Hi. Hi. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. You're it's hilarious. my pleasure. Uh, I want to know, kind of a fun question. What has been your favorite set to work on? Your favorite movie set and your least favorite, and why? Oh. That is a really hard question. Um. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um. I did like Up in the Air a lot because it felt like we were making a really small movie, um, like especially because I mostly interact with George and I interact with Vera Farmiga a little bit in that movie. It felt like it w was just the three of us making that movie, and it was you know kind of a big production and a big budget. Um, but at the same time, like doing something like Into the Woods was so like dream come true like I remember standing with Tracy Ullman who's like a goddess and being on that set in Pinewood Studios in London where a lot of that some some of the scenes in the woods we did outside in the woods but some of it was on a stage and the stage was so enormous that like you couldn't we couldn't tell where it ended like um and Chris Pine's like riding in on a horse and and Tracy and I were just like can you believe that we're here and I was like I can't fucking believe I'm having this conversation with Tracy Ullman <laughs> and um it just it's how you think every film set will be you know like that it'll be this production where you get to wear this like 
corset and this p period costumes and um, and that's really the only experience that I've had like that. Uh, and to make it interesting, I'll say that was also <laughs> my least favorite set because um, it was cold all the time because they built a real forest in a studio and it was so huge that like you couldn't keep it warm and there was dirt everywhere and like you know they had to pump so much. Um, uh, smoke into the studio to get like the atmosphere right that I would this is gross but I'll just share I would go home and blow my nose and be black <laughs> um, so it was one of those things where I was like so happy to be there and then like my ribs and feet hurt at the end of the night because the costumes were very unforgiving so it was like one of those sets where I had to be like so grateful to be here so rem remind yourself this is a dream job <laughs> so happy thank you thank you that's awesome um, in the book, you talk about wanting to be a doctor, like when you were little. That's like oh, the, yeah. the story that your mom That's loves. when I thought I was smart. You're going to be a doctor, um, but you know, you're an actress, singer, you didn't have a backup plan. But if you weren't doing this, because you clearly love it, what, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, I'm hoping I'd like have one of those bullshit racket jobs where I was like a life coach or a like, personal <laughs> organizer or something, like one of those like <laughs> made up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are people who do it well and are effective, but I'd just be really bad at it. But that like, that's what convince you people. I'd have a like a nice aesthetic on my Instagram, so people would be like, "She seems like she's onto something." <laughs> are you good at advice, like in general, outside of the career advice? Like, no. are you no? Very so bad. you just like that's just what you would like to do. Mm -hmm. it's hilarious. You just ruin people's lives <laughs> willfully. Oh my god. Okay, question over here. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for speaking into the microphone, even though it's clearly not on. <laughs> I like that about you. You're a rule follower. I like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Do you know? I don't fucking know. Do you like? Would you? Do you guys know? Like, do you have answers when people ask you that? Can I have a show of hands? Like, do you have like a, a teed up answer? Nobody. <laughs> You're Google. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> no, I think that's one of those insane questions. Like, I feel like a sociopath would have a great answer for that question, Maybe. but I, I don't. I don't have a plan. Like. I mean, honestly, sometimes I feel like my plan is like to work as hard as I can until I have a nervous breakdown and have to say that I have lupus or something. <laughs> like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I'm excited all the time and terrified all the time. Awesome. How do you, how do you feel? I feel uh, that's great. How do you feel about my life? I feel like you've got it all figured out. So okay, great. I need a lot of validation. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, we'll go, we'll go over here. Hi. Hey, uh, so I was in an acapella group in college yeah. and recently went to, I'm not going to sing with you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, I Recently wasn't went do that to either. like ICCA championships in New York, which Whoa. were like definitely not as fun as the movie Pitch Perfect. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk about like how just making that movie in general, how fun it was, like the musical. <laughs> Like, well, first of all, of I can tell you the reason that real acapella competitions, while very impressive, are not as fun as the movie Pitch Perfect, because they actually have to sing live and dance. So the dance moves are more like walking. <laughs> and like we are like trying to get down to the best of our um, uh, like non-dancer abilities. So uh, we are like we fall on the floor after the dance numbers, so obviously we can't actually sing during them. If you could do an ICCA, it, uh, this is a real competition. Um, if, you, if the ICCAs could like pre-record their vocals and then dance to them, like they'd really be onto something. But then they'd just be like pop stars in the 90s. So. Ooh, burn on pop stars in the 90s. <laughs> Is that, I don't know, did that answer your question? Not really, but I just... <laughs> Okay. What, uh, sorry, what, what else did you need to know? Just, <laughs> just curious if you could <laughs> talk about just make how much fun it was to make the movie in general. It was really fun. Okay, good song. <laughs> All right. All right, we're going over here. <laughs> oh, nice, wait. Hi, Anna. Um, I was just wondering... Since you mentioned earlier uh, that you wanted to play more roles, like that 16-year-old smelly girl, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Oh my God, you think I could pass for 16? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm 19, so. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. understand I don't what's happening, but great. <laughs> um, this kind of made me think about uh, what kind of advice you would give for someone who like isn't really comfortable in the position they're in. Yeah. Uh, like how you would find like an environment where you're kind of safe to be yourself. You know, um, my uh, my friend Ben Platt. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was the biggest name drop of the night. Um, he, I think, he said it best. He, uh, you know, in his Tony speech, he said, "What makes you different is what makes you powerful." And I was like, "That thing, yes, what he said." Um, so, yeah, it's. Um, I, I think like finding your tribe is important, uh, whatever that means, and uh, and. I always hate that I hate that thing of like when adults are like, "Oh, none of this will matter in the real world and what cuz you know, if you're in it, it sucks for you now." You know, I like if somebody asked me to suffer through 4 years of feeling targeted and ostracized, I would be like, "I really don't want to do that." And you <laughs> telling me that it'll be over in 4 years doesn't make it better. Um, so I think like just trying to like find strength in yourself if you if you feel um, misunderstood and knowing that um, that you are powerful and you know the things that make you odd and the things that people don't understand are the things that you know give you value in the world I th I think I'm just paraphrasing what he said he said it better <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah thank you thanks Go hey over here hello you seem like a pretty grounded person, so I'm wondering, what do you focus on like outside the industry that um, makes you grounded or makes you happy? Um, I, I, I don't know. I should probably have a more profound answer for this, but I grew up in kind of like a black Irish humor kind of family, and um, finding humor was always the thing that, like, how how we got through everything and like I, I'm a big fan of gallows humor and um, just kind of undercutting everything um, so uh, I kind of idolize comedians and uh, you know like I just did a movie with Chris Morris I don't know if you guys know the British comedian Chris Morris he's uh, like the, the, the just the darkest motherfucker around so um, uh, like that kind of thing just like reminds me it's basically like I can't hang out with my older brother all the time anymore because we live across the country. But like he would be the guy to be like, you're being a pretentious piece of shit, like chill. Um, and since I can't have that, it's like I just uh, try to like look at Morgan Murphy's Twitter accounts and stuff like that. <laughs> nice, thanks. I have a related question, sort of like outside the industry. If you were on Jeopardy and could pre-select the category, what would it be? Oh, and why? What do I know a lot about? Um, uh, the script of Clueless? I, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, that's a good question, and it like Sing really out. makes you realize the things you know really well are mostly embarrassing. <laughs> um, uh, I guess like thirty screwball films. I guess I like those a lot. You look, know those the lines by heart and yeah. like know all the characters' names and scenes. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, we're gonna take take you over here, Richard. Hi. Um. So I I became familiar with you from your early theatrical career. I saw High Society when I was trying out in San Francisco. What the? F I know. I, I went with the Latin club. I was very popular. Um, and then <laughs> I I saw a Camp when it was in theaters, and I was curious. Um, what motivated you to go from theater to film, and if you would ever consider a return? Well, uh, when I when I did High Society in New York, um, Randy Graf uh, was uh, in it, and she, uh, I became very close to her, and I uh, loved her very much. And her cousin Todd Graf directed the movie Camp, so uh, she told me that I should audition for this movie, and especially because that movie was about musical theater kids, uh, that seemed like the right thing to do and then I had such an amazing experience with Todd and with those kids and kind of realized that you know while there are 
uh, you're more likely to run into assholes, I guess, in it, like in terms of movie actors. But I, I think actors are it, like out of their minds, but wonderful presences to be around. And I had such a great experience on that that uh, I wanted to keep doing that. And I also started to actually understand the mechanics of making a movie, and that was exciting because the first movie was mostly me being totally terrified and going like, wait, I have to look over here even though she's standing over there and um, like not understanding what was happening. And then like learning how, the, like learning about the filmmaking process was, was really exciting to me. I don't know if that was interesting. No, uh, totally. <laughs> and, and are you considering going back to theater at some point? Yeah, I would. I would love to. I. I like. I look at like Bette Midler and Hello Dolly, and she can do that because she's Bette Midler. Um, so I think I would want to do a new piece so that it wasn't just selfishly to take the pressure off myself. It just I wouldn't want to, you know, follow up on anybody else's performance to do like a revival. But um, I would love to do a new piece. When were you the most nervous? Because you you did an opening number for the Oscars, right? Mm -hmm. That must have been a little. Nerve, yeah, I think, I think the 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 I can tell you that the times in my life I've the three times I've been most nervous was doing uh, uh, Life Upon the Wicked Stage at Carnegie Hall. I did this weird performance when I was like 13 years old and Julie Andrews was there, so oh, wow. um, that was terrifying. And then the first time I did David Letterman, like fully thought I was gonna pass out, <laughs> and then the performing at the Oscars. The Oscars, yeah. yeah, the Oscars is like a big one. All right, let's take a question over here. Hi, hi. Um, so before you mentioned that vanity will hold you back, and I was wondering, like, obviously there was a point in your life when you transitioned between, like, auditioning for roles and not having a name and having, like, the celebrity status and people knowing you, and what did that transition look like, and how did it impact you as a person or your career? Like, I'm assuming well, you don't audition Yeah, anymore. I mean, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if this is, like, exactly what you're talking about, but I the the point where I suddenly like started like getting going on red carpets and stuff and promoting the movie um, and like getting dressed and like people were doing my hair and makeup and stuff I've never felt more hideous because people like teams of people are putting hours of effort into like how you look and that's never happened before and then you go on a red carpet and Joan Rivers is like C minus and you're like what the fuck this is the best I've ever looked in my life. <laughs> um, so that is a rude awakening. Um, but uh, I think, like, yeah, like, I had also never been in a position to be uh, compared to Natalie Portman. Was, that shouldn't happen to any woman ever. Um, <laughs> so, like, I, I always thought, like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I do okay. I get mine, you know? <laughs> um, and then I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not supposed to be compared to Blake Lively, which is the movie I'm doing right now, so that's good for my self-esteem. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it kind of just took me kind of saying, like, you know, the, the best thing I can do with what is happening in my brain right now is know that I have never had to lie awake at night and go, do... Do I offer anything? Am I like? Uh, am I only getting the work that I'm getting because I'm so hot? <laughs> um, and that I have to just go. Well, that's a blessing because at least I know I have value, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, so really, let's say a prayer for the really, really pretty girls. They're the ones who have it rough. Am I right? These poor things. Wait, real quick follow up. Oh, no. I have okay. no idea if that was the question. I, yeah. I honestly was thinking about how weirdly soft this microphone is. <laughs> really Thank nice. you. <laughs> Over here. Hello. I'm really big fan. So I guess I was wondering, like, you've written this book. You're working on a lot of movies. How do you manage your time? Like, how do you manage, like, doing all these things that you want to do that you do for your career? That is such a great question. Oh, um, and I will tell you when I figure it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, honestly, like I've there, I've tried to do a couple things recently to correct the fact that I felt like I was. Uh, I'm gonna get really real. Uh, I was like letting everybody in my life down because I just didn't. I like had spread myself too thin and said yes to too many things, and therefore I was like constantly. Peop I felt like everybody was mad at me. You know, like I wasn't maintaining friendships and family relationships, and like have recently, you know tried to make sure that that is happening. So I, I guess just having to say to, you know, 
to people like no I no I absolutely can't do that like I think I forget that when somebody wants you to do something like you can't really gauge how important it is because it's just like what they want so actually saying like this is how much I really don't want to do this so let's talk about how important these things are and make some decisions um, and that's a really uncomfortable place to be because normally I, I feel more like I'm going oh, do could, is there any way that we could and the second that I get that ooh, we kind of planned and you know this has been worked on and it's it's been decided I was like oh then, then totally then totally and like having to um, a assert that like no I'm gonna have to like compartmentalize here and make some time for my mama you know <laughs> Thank Otherwise, you. she gets really mad at me Back to the book for one second. Um, just in writing it, what's like your hope or one thing you want people to take away? Is it more like laughter or story of you? I mean, that was that was what I wanted <laughs> people to take away from it. I was like, I just wanted it to be really funny. That was like my goal. And since I'm not a, a writer by trade or a comedian or something, I, that was like the best thing that I could hope is that people would laugh. And you know, my editor was like, maybe put some serious stuff in there. And I was like, ew. <laughs> um, so, um, but actually I think th the thing that I get comments on the most is the section about being nice and, um, and how it's just not something that I'm prioritizing anymore. So fuck all of you. <laughs> um, and that was something that I thought for sure, like, would I would send it to my editor and she would be like, you're coming off a little bitter in this section, but she was like, no, this is right on, so. It's um, authentic, and yeah. to, to the question we just had, like, it's, it's yeah. you, yeah. like, it's you, and yeah. so, it's great. Question over here. Howdy. Um, Hi. So you mentioned that going into camp, it felt pretty natural since it was more musical theater oriented. I was curious how it felt to go into the role in rocket science, where it was heavily debate-based, and it's a weird culture to begin with. So I was just wondering your opinion on that. Well, yeah. it was it was really fun, and the um, the the writer and director came from policy debate, and he did have a intense stutter, and uh, I don't he didn't join because of a manipulative psychotic girl, so I was made up, but uh, I had a great time with that because I knew that he was getting all the details right. Like, they had this like really specific thing about what boxes we, yeah, look at your face, um, <laughs> we used, and like knowing that um, like certain subcultures can be explored in each, uh, in like different movies was kind of, you know, kind of exciting, and like knowing that you would get that recognition of, like, and when I watched, when I watch like movies about theater or making movies, I love it when they get everything right, and it's really frustrating when they don't. So, I think it's always fun to be able to honor that and know that like somebody's gonna go get those fucking boxes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Question, Danny. Hi, thank you for coming, and I love you. Don't worry, I won't show up at your house, though. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, why did you want to include Google as part of your book tour? We need affirmations, too. Um, <laughs> you guys seem smart. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I always think it's crazy that you guys would want, like, professional people would want to talk to me, and I always feel like I get something out of it, too. And, like, you guys have asked really great questions and you're all young and attractive, so <laughs> just <laughs> looking to get laid, really. <laughs> How's that for, is that a good affirmation? That was perfect. <laughs> Very Thank attractive you. group here at Google. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Over here. Hi, um, I know we talked a little, we mentioned your Twitter account and I just wanted to ask you about that. I actually don't have Twitter, I don't really do Twitter, but when I see funny tweets being reposted elsewhere, they're often yours and they're often very funny. Um, <laughs> So I was just wondering, how does that, that's always a question, like how do you, do you just like wake up and think of funny things and then post them, or how do you go about like creating your Twitter? Um, it's just like when I think of something funny, I, um, I follow Andy Richter um, in, in, from Conan, and, and I, I, when I go on Conan, he was like, you should tweet more, you're funny, you should tweet more, and I was like, I, I am not like holding back, it's not like a quality control thing, it's like a supply and demand brilliant thing on my part. It's just like when I think of things like, and sometimes as an exercise, I'll try to think of a joke and like, it'll always go down okay. Like I'll like sit in an airport and like try to th come up with a joke and tweet something and it's always like, no, 
That's not right. Um, <laughs> so it's more just like, um, uh, like you know, weird things will pop into my head. And recently, I texted some of the girls from Pitch Perfect because I was like, I need a female opinion on whether I can post about that thing where you put in a new tampon and then you're like, did I take out my old tampon? <laughs> like five minutes that. later. I saw that meme. Um, and they said yes. So, so I was like, okay, so I'm not the only one. I've never done it, but I always think it. Oh God. <laughs> okay, over here. Uh, hey, thanks for being with us. Um, uh, I thought you were great in the Trolls movie, and uh, I wanted to know if you could give something to Justin Timberlake for me. Is it a thumb? <laughs> no, uh, no. Seriously, um, uh, voice acting versus live acting. Is there anything about it that you like more or less? I, I mean, the, the the big joke is like you get to go to work in your pajamas, and I would do that anyway. Um, so, like, yeah, like voice acting is preferable in the sense that like you get to be comfortable, but it's it's like the best acting class I've ever been in because you get um, on a film that you get a direction and you're like, okay, and like I have that kind of physical, you know, emotional response to like, I, I see what you're saying and I'm, you know, I want to, you know, execute on that right now. And then like 10 minutes later, you get to do it and you're like filtering it through, okay, but I have to hit this mark and I, and I have to have the cup in this hand, so I've switched it there. And you know, make sure I'm in my light or whatever. And it's being able to just follow through on those intentions, like the second that you have them is so fantastic. And it's like the most freeing experience because you don't have to like fight through these layers of of the, the filmmaking process, which is important. And I honestly, I can't stand it when I'm working with somebody who's like, you know, all over the map and is like completely like, you know, the camera can follow you, but like there's equipment in the background. So like the shot's unusable. So congratulations on the great performance you just gave. It's not going in the movie, you know? So I, I really want to like respect the process and make sure that I'm doing my job to the best of my ability while not making anybody else's job harder. But to not have any of those obstacles is like so freeing and so amazing. I would do it forever. It's so much fun. Especially that character, because she's out of her mind. Thanks. In a pink way. Well, today, the question I wanted to make sure to ask you, <clears throat> you're in Twilight the Eclipse, or Twilight Eclipse, which is literally the only link to today's Whoa. eclipse <laughs> <laughs> that, that I could find. Actually, someone sent it to me. Um, but we were talking a little earlier, and a lot of people are saying that today's uh, eclipse is going to cause life transformation. So I wanted to know. Are people really saying They that? really are. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? Real true fact, people. For true fact. Oh yeah, I read about it. <laughs> what? Why, wait, I have so many follow-up questions. Why? What? What is going to be life transforming about it? Like, they, uh, like, is this be, like genuinely? They think like it, like it will have like a, an effect, like on wow, we're all under the same sun and we're we're all one, or like in the way like your horoscope will. They say Earth whatever was starting to shift in March 2016 is going to come to fruition today. So I don't know. You'd have to think back to March 2016. There's also like some bad spirits. Oh, okay, that are so it's to nonsense. Come out. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. I just want to make sure it's nonsense. It's not like somebody had some kind of a, a fact based. We're at Google. Come on. <laughs> they don't have time for nonsense. <laughs> All right, question over here. Um, hi, so how do you go about picking a project and somewhat related, is there anything, because you've had a nice kind of run of different genres, is there any project or film you have not done that you're really excited about possibly pursuing in the future? Uh, well, I did, like, silly bucket list. I had always wanted to do a Christmas movie, and I'm doing one later in the year, so... Uh. Um, <laughs> Uh, as far as picking projects, like this is one of those answers, like the five-year plan, where I feel like I should have an answer and I don't. And um, I, I mean, honestly, it's it's. You read a lot of bad scripts. There are a lot of bad scripts in the world. There are a lot of bad ideas. And uh, and when there are good ones, people fight over them. And luck, sometimes it lines up that there's a great script and and you know I fight harder. And uh, and and that's. Great. So it always seems pretty obvious to me, like what I'm gonna choose. Uh, 
And like every now and then there'll be something that's good, but I'm like, I, I've played this character like three times in a row. Uh, and you don't want to then have that thing of like, oh, they're kind of a one trick pony. And I, you know, I, I'm sure that applies like to a lot of areas of life. Maybe it doesn't, and I'm just trying to make this seem relevant <laughs> for you guys. Um, but I think it's it's not like there's some kind of like master stroke to any of it. And and knowing that, like nobody's had a perfect career ever. Like that's another question that people ask you a lot is like, whose career do you want to emulate? And nobody's had a perfect career. Everybody's made crappy movies. And knowing that's kind of freeing, like knowing that you're going to screw up and make mistakes is kind of freeing because it just means that like I should choose things based on what I think is gonna like be personally satisfying and then like a number of them will work and a number of them will be really terrible and that's okay. And, but I do you ever have like strong intuition that this is gonna be a great movie or this is gonna be a great experience going into it before you take it? Yes. And it, like the last movie that I had that with did not work at all. Oh, so nobody so liked no it. So like you just don't know, <laughs> and nobody know. goes into any movie, any project, any any work related thing like trying to make it bad. And sometimes you just it happens, and I don't know <laughs> why. Um, but again, I think that's like weirdly freeing, like knowing yeah. like you can't control it and you can't right. like make all the right decisions. It's just like. It's just you just have to try to ex like experience, experience joy, <laughs> however you can. <laughs> Often for me, it's watching the sorry music video because those <laughs> dancers are great. Question over here. Hey there. Um, I loved hearing earlier about your uh, affinity for '90s sitcoms and wanting to be in one of the holiday scenes. Yeah. And, and as Molly will attest, I'm I'm kind of a '90s sitcom aficionado, so I'm curious. Yes. What um, what is your favorite one, or what character would you wish you had played in one of them? My favorite one is the one with Chandler in a box, <laughs> <laughs> where he's in the and he's you know just, you know what I'm talking about. Friends, yeah. Yeah, where the he Chandler kisses Joey's girlfriend, and um, Joey makes him spend Thanksgiving in a box. Um, <laughs> but you know they're all like dressed really cute, and they have like banter, and we're all pretending it's not insane that you put your friend in a box. <laughs> um, so that's my dream. And also, like even like Thanksgiving episodes of like, these aren't 90s, but like Community and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I love that we're just suspending disbelief that like you spend your Thanksgiving with your work <laughs> colleagues, and your community college, and like a group of friends, and none of you are going home to see your families. We're all just fine with that. The, the magic of the movies, of course. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to get friends like that. Do you guys want to have Thanksgiving together? Hi. Hi. Uh, I was a big fan of the last five years. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about making that movie and your inspiration for the role of Kathy. That was a close runner-up for my favorite film set. Uh, I was going to maybe say it earlier, but I thought there'll be like one person, and it's you. Um, uh, I loved, that was so much fun. It, we had like no time and no money, and we sang a lot of, we sang as much live as we could, and uh, I, yeah, that was such a dream, because I, my favorite musical is Parade uh, by Justin Robert Brown, and I had like somehow, like cosmically, I had never, uh, heard the last five years so they sent me this script and I read the script without knowing the music and they had the lyrics and they just had like stage direction and the lyrics and I was weeping reading it and then the next morning I woke up and listened to the soundtrack as I read along and I was just like beside myself so I think it was kind of like meant to happen that way otherwise a I'm one of those people where I would have it would have been impossible for me to not sing it in the exact intonation as the original cast album like Rent it's like, nobody. Um, uh, like, I am grateful that I didn't have to overcome, like, getting that voice out of my head. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I think, like, I had some personal experience that I was drawing on for that role. And um, just kind of, like, being able to work with Jason Robert Brown and his amazing wife, who was our music director, um, who like likes to make the joke that the only person in the world who thinks that the last five years has a happy ending is his new wife. <laughs> okay, uh, wrong crowd. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, and yeah, I just couldn't have had a, a better experience on that. Um, and I think 
if we'd had a little more time, we could have gotten a little more coverage. Some of those angles, I'm like, why are we holding this so long? Oh, right, it's because we didn't shoot anything else. Um, but like sometimes movies are held together with love and duct tape, and that's what makes them really special. So I'm glad you liked it. Thank you so much. Thank that you. That means a lot. All right, I, really I think like we have one. time for one more. Um, so can we have... I'm actually going to apologize because if I had known I was the last person asking a question, I would have come up with something more serious. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a number of years ago on Twitter, you had a back and forth between yourself and Dwayne The Rock Johnson about making a movie called Rock and Pebble. Yeah, The Rock and the Pebble. <laughs> I'm the pebble. Get it? <laughs> it's because I'm small. <laughs> so, so now, if you were to make this movie, what would, the movie, what would be the movie's oh my God, theme you guys. and what would it be about? You guys are smart people, so we could like, come up with this. We could storyboard this like right now <laughs> and pitch it to The Rock. Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like uh, he really excels in like a buddy cop comedy kind of thing. Um, so I think, you know, just the... Just a kind of classic buddy comedy, like, you know, we're on a mission and, um, you know, I'm kind of useless the entire time and he has to save the day, but then, like, right at the end, I do something. Save the day. <laughs> um, you know, like something like, oh no, this tiny crawl space, and, like, <laughs> and I'm like, this is my moment. Um, so I think, it, yeah, it'll be the first buddy cop comedy to end with a high stakes crawl space uh, <laughs> sequence. So when's it coming out? I'd like to get tickets now. Um, uh, whenever Game of Thrones is finished, so like 2020, I guess. Because we're not trying to compete with that. <laughs> thank you. Thank Amazing. you. All right, guys, let's thank Anna for coming to Google today. Anna. Um,